Live. We're live, right. Here we are, live on a, I honestly lost track of the day, it's Thursday afternoon, 12 to 1 o'clock, here with James Kirkham, Defected Records. How are you? I'm just talking about how the fact that it feels like you've got a new job, but you don't feel like you've got a new job. Uh, that The 10 weeks I've been in this new job feels like, I don't know, 10 years, certainly 10 months. Uh, but yeah, I've got a new job. I'm in music now rather than... When we last spoke, actually, was uh, was one of your live uh, video records, uh, and it was in Cannes in the sunshine. Oh, it was. Just, it was a lot nicer. We would, not, we would not have imagined that the next time we speak would be during a global pandemic on lockdown. Definitely not. Definitely not. Um, but here we find ourselves, and we're having to adapt as quickly as we possibly can. And in music, I think especially, you know, there is an opportunity because so many people are... Um, around the house they've got they've got to have something to do um but it is you know it is hard for every industry but you guys are are um thinking of different things to do and you have been live streaming right like we are right now yeah i mean we're you know we're sort of fortunate anyway at defected so for those who don't know defected is like a 21 year old dance music label um but being a music machine it, that's what it literally does it produces music and you know there's been a dip in streaming, but actually we've just seen some of our biggest ever streaming figures. So music's still going to be there. It needs to be there. However, another as, uh, sort of facet of what we do at Defected is events and festivals and ultimately parties. So Defected uh, run a Croatia festival in August. We have a huge Ibiza season that sort of spans May right until the end uh, of September. But of course, we're in a different time right now. So uh, a few weeks ago, we wanted to work out if we can still bring people together uh, through the love of dance music. Um, so we came up sort of overnight, actually, on WhatsApp, about half a dozen of us on a Sunday night on WhatsApp, as generally happens, came up with the what became the Defected Virtual Festival. We were going to put out um, a bunch of wicked old videos that no one had seen for sort of 12 hours from boat parties, like epic old sessions. But when we made the announcement, a load of DJs, uh, people we work with, all leaned in. Uh, they said they wanted to be involved. The Ministry of Sound then wanted to be involved. And this is a couple of weeks ago prior to the full lockdown. So we ended up on a Friday afternoon in a completely empty Ministry of Sound, which is definitely the first time that's happened, played to millions of people and all of the DJs from Simon Dunmore to Shapeshifters to Sam Devine said, Weirdly, it was the most nervous they've ever been in an empty room knowing you're broadcasting to so many. Uh, and we did it the following week. Um, and we weren't intending to do it the following week. We did it because, uh, as you boys well know, uh, the audience is a pretty hungry, vociferous bunch at the moment, actually. And people need the love and light and laughter and all of that sort of stuff brought into their lives and demanded we returned. <laughs> Uh, and the next one, we did more of a consecutive bespoke sets. We got uh, people like uh, Follamore and Charisma and stuff. We got some wicked classic sets, Hallsmeet Disco. And we basically strung it together over the Friday afternoon. And it ended up being like the soundtrack, someone called it Owning the Lockdown, like the soundtrack of this time maybe, where people, as I say, need that in their lives. Having a drink, kids watching it with their parents, being introduced to house music for the first time. Uh, so it's pretty nice to know that people are involved and you've got a lot of coverage off the back of it right like a lot of people are taking note i mean we were talking just a minute ago about the fact that your goal when you first started the job yeah. uh, was to get it into the mainstream media and you didn't believe that it would happen within 10 weeks well yeah i mean defective have just got this most amazing vociferous kind of community it's like the largest house music community in the world over five million fans and followers but yeah, one of the one of the things I said was, look, I want to go further and wider. And I certainly didn't envisage within 10 weeks, yeah, we'll be sat here in lockdown, but we'd be on Forbes magazine, it'd be in the Telegraph. We were on Steve Wright on Radio 2, Radio 1. We did an interview with Six Music this week. The organic pickup's been kind of crazy, but it's because it's because of the moment. And again, we spoke very briefly just before we went on air here, like, People need certain stuff at certain times. And if you can act quick, and Defected is a 
you know, uh, a, a nimble business. And I've, I've worked at nimble agencies like Hollow My Own at Copper 90. Defected is bloody quick. Like when they go for it, we've just been coming up with an idea this morning that we're putting out tonight. You can act quickly and everyone can get involved. And trying to capture that, I guess, people's love and, and imagination at the time. Like we had, I don't know if you saw, but the, the whole fan part of it, we had a guy raving from a hospital bed in Greece. We had nurses in their ambulance with an iPad with their virtual festival on the gear stick, which is probably terrible, as they were driving. Uh, <laughs> the point is, it got everyone, it got those layers of involvement that we probably couldn't have anticipated. We wanted to be here for people. We didn't anticipate quite how much people were, were needing it and wanting it at this time. I think you definitely, you've, you've taken advantage of, <coughs> pardon me, um, thank you. You've taken advantage of the first mover advantage, really. Um, you know, I, I think someone else that's done it in a different field, but but similarly is is obviously what Joe Wicks has done on, on, on yeah. Fit. He was the first person, he probably wasn't the first person, but the first person of note to yeah. really step forward and establish that sort of every half, and you know, the same time every day, half an hour. Yeah, about yeah. That. And yeah. you know now every fitness influencer is doing live streams, but he's he's the one everyone's still going towards. I I assume you've seen lots of other um, agencies, lots of other similar businesses now jumping on this and probably not quite getting the same benefit. Do you think that you yeah. get that benefit because people are so desperate for content that they the first person that does it, they're they're almost thankful for the bravery to do it. Does that make sense? You almost get a bit more sense, yeah. I'd be interested to know what you think from the flip side when you've got individuals like Joe, but we'll come back to that. But 100%, when we came up with it on WhatsApp that Sunday night, like I described, we also knew, we said, we get this out tomorrow, as in we tell everyone tomorrow, because we know people would be trying to do something similar. And lo and behold, a week or two in, many are, and yeah, the numbers aren't as big, but good for them. I mean, yeah. the, the thing we've talked to with the team so much, and I bet you lot have, is creativity from adversity. So our whole philosophy at Defected is this kind of disco philosophy anyway. I was already speaking with brands, with partners a while ago, talking about our times now are fractured and divided. We're post-Brexit, post-Trump, like this disco philosophy where there's a lovely quote we often use by Honey Dijon, which is dance floors unite people in a way that governments and religions never could. And I bloody love that. But right now, there's no dance floor. So what's our version of it? Now, it's people doing stuff like this. It's bringing people together. Like I was idly scrolling through Instagram, as we all are, I think, at the weekend. And I thought, say what you want about this. But there's a shed load of good stuff out there at the moment. Like my favorite thing at the moment is, um, I used to be a bit of an indie kid, is Tim Burgess, the lead singer of The Charlatans, does these listening parties on. And it's just combining Twitter. It combines you playing out the album. And it's all the fan paraphernalia, the flyers the i was there feeling it's so simple but it's bringing people together so any moment like joe wicks in front of millions including my son of a morning like that's a pretty smart thing to do like he, he will be stellar now as a consequence and again it's a it's a world yeah. you know better than me an influencer like that being there at the start i presume that their star just continues to shine then right yeah i think he'll he'll you know he's now moved into sort of a list uk celebrity really um okay. and i think he he won't drop out of it now because of that you know what i mean he he will have earned a reputation over the last week or two that you know will you know things can always go quickly but and if, if, as long as he doesn't do something horrendous I, I i can't see his star fading um he's he's just taken advantage of it in a non and i say taking advantage of it i don't mean in a i know in a sort of capitalists let me try and take advantage of people but there's an opportunity he's seen the opportunity he's taken advantage of the opportunity actually i think it benefits people i think what joe wicks is doing is a borderline national service you know allowing you know tens of millions of parents to pl plant their children in front of something in half an hour is hugely valuable right now um, that, that notion of routine is interesting and you implied that in your question yeah. And again, another thing we're finding is people are looking for that as well. So in our example, yeah, there's a lot of people dancing around their living rooms with a gin and tonic in their hand or people having a beer reminiscing about when they were last together in Ibiza or whatever. But there's something about the routine that people are actually asking for as well, 
which again feels paradoxical in a world of complete on-demand culture. But it's almost like, as with Joe Wicks, he's doing a PE lesson at 11 a.m. or whatever time it is each day. People are almost requiring the stability of a routine and how people can fuel that with content or innovation perhaps determines how successful they will be. I think what you obviously being from an agency side as, as well will have done the same thing as, you know, the amount of times where we've gone through, okay, let's look at the consumer behavior of this. And you're literally mapping out right from between seven and nine, they'll be commuting, then they'll be doing this, then they'll be doing that at lunchtime, they'll be doing this, they'll be coming home. That is now a blank sleep, you know, a, a blank piece of paper, essentially. So it's for me, the opportunity for people like you guys, for Joe Wicks, for, for brands, for everybody, is how to fill segments of that day with something that adds value to consumers and, you know, really own the time point of view. You know, who owns the time he does it? Who owns 6 or 7 p.m.? You know, the minister, the government owns 5 till 6 with their press conference. You know, who owns 6 or 7? Who owns 7 till 8? Who owns 8 till 9? Like, I think it's a race to try and take those time periods essentially because even the big shows the big tv shows that historically have taken those things at the, at, at the weekends they're going to start reducing you know they can't keep making them Absolutely. so at some point what saturday night tv going to be you know what's you know is emmerdale going to continue to be shown it's obviously being shown on a reduced schedule at the moment which means you know whatever time it is seven eight you know wherever yeah. how big gaps there for people to go and fill you know, for the last five nights in a row, I've done a quiz with my family. If you said to me a month ago, you're going to do a quiz with your family five nights in a row, I would kill myself. <laughs> There's no way I would have wanted to do that. But this is where we're at. <laughs> do. So, and, here we, and here we are owning the 12 till 1 o'clock yeah. slot uh, yeah. for the, for the, for the yeah. nation. <laughs> yeah. for the nation. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> In, in terms of, I think what's really interesting, a story came out today, Guardian ran it, um, that Finland enlists social influencers to fight against uh, uh, coronavirus. Um, it's it's not just uh, traditional influencers, but also using um, bloggers, rappers, you know, non-traditional, non-mainstream music. You know, there's obviously a huge appeal uh, outside of the traditional government communications in order to get this message out. And do you think there's also a responsibility, James, for people who are yeah. not in stream to get out and help spread the right messages yeah i think there's two parts to that isn't there um definitely a feeling of responsibility i think brands uh, uh, you know we, we can do it easily in inverted commas at defected because that's sort of what a label like defected does it puts out you know music that moves you it makes you feel good or euphoric or a beautiful chill out or whatever that the style of record might be like that's that's literally a part of what we do and it's a part of what we do with events and parties too the idea that people come together and gather around a certain moment and respond to a track when it's dropped like if we can somehow impart and engender this feeling through a day like we're just talking about the time parting there with aaron you know the idea one of our artists sam divine put a set up last night from which she did an ib thrift vedger and again i think it's like hundred thousand people watching it overall which is Big numbers for a single artist without a huge promotion. People are yearning for it like right now. If you can inject positivity, if you are a inherently celebratory business, you know, my old business, Copper 90, always took that stance with football. It's like, what is the celebratory positive part? I think that's never been more important than now. People need to feel united, part of something together. You know, Aaron's doing a bloody quiz with his family every night. But as you say, you, you wouldn't have dreamt of that. But the ways in which people can do that, and I bet brands, I think we're in, what, three weeks or whatever it is. Like, people like us move quickly and we're innovating and changing again. I'd imagine once the big agency groups get up to speed, once the big brands have got it through their kind of corporate layers, we're going to see a shed load in the coming weeks. And I think there's there's room for a ton of creativity in this. Like, as long as people keep innovating, like in my world, in music, the guys at Warner's put out that, I thought, beautifully edited Dua Lipa piece. I think it's for the James Corden show. And it was yeah. all the dancers, the backing singers, using the grammar, the visual language and grammar of Zoom. We wouldn't have known that a month ago. You know, Zoom was still something I'd use at five o'clock with a San Francisco client. It wasn't a 
the basis of a Dua Lipa video. Like, mm -hmm. as much as this is all adversity, I love stuff like that, where that creativity flourishes. Yeah, and it's needed. You're absolutely right. I think it's it's needed more now than ever. You know, I think there's a there's the last couple of weeks particularly has been a bit. People have been a bit unsure about what to do and a bit unsure about you know if you're not donating medically, maybe just shut up. And actually, I think I, I completely disagree with that. And I I think it's what you're saying. It's that people need good stuff right now more than they did three months ago. So if you're someone that can provide that good stuff, then I would say you're obligated to do it now, like more more so than you were two months ago. So, you know, people should be really driving that good stuff. And I think you're right. I think it's just going to take a couple of weeks for the bigger boys to catch up. And yeah. then two or three weeks' time, you're going to see a, a, a huge output of, of great content that tries to lift people. But have you but have you guys found that brands are leaning in, you know, people your clients effectively are leaning and looking for more quick ideas now to make them look either purposeful or to fill that time or to engage people when now that they're hungry for it? Yeah, definitely. I mean they're, they're looking to do creative things, they're looking to do things that are smart, but they're they're also very, very tone sensitive in this time. I think there is caution still, but far less caution than there was two weeks ago. Um, and people want to help as well. There's lots of brands we're talking to who are like, yeah, look, we just we have this product and we just want to get it out there. Um, I was on the phone this morning to an FMCG brand who's like, yeah, we've got loads of stock and you know, obviously we're seeing huge amount of sales because people want to want to buy our products right now off the shelves. But at the same time, we've got loads of stock in warehouses that we just want to get out to homeless people in the UK. We want to get it out to uh, Spanish hospitals, you know, all these different things across Europe. You know, actually, there is a force for good from these brands too, and and also a mandate from the top, which is great. That is good because there's that's reminding me that there's all these. There's a couple of other bits that I think have flourished from this. So one is one again is a bit paradoxical. Is that this distance, this virtual distance that goes on? Like we have a, a leadership call every morning at eight thirty, for example, on Zoom. You've got dogs barking in the background. You've got people smashing around a kitchen. It's made it more personal. Mm -hmm. It's made it, there's, you've, you've taken away all of the work kind of barriers that exist in a normal work formula. And you're seeing stuff and talking in a far more personal way than we were before. And weirdly, it's created, I think, a greater closeness. The other thing that's flourished, let's be honest, is meme culture. Like, humor has gone through the roof. And I mean good stuff, like <laughs> quite amazing quality creative memes like if you're not spending all day responding to 14 different whatsapp groups with the very latest kind of funny tiger king paste based meme then yeah. what else are you doing do you know what i mean but i love the humor that's kind of flourished in all this yeah i think it's 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 what gets humans through challenging times isn't it is is there's always particularly for the british i think it's, it's <laughs> yeah. our is, is to go into that sort of dark humor i can only imagine you know even during the brits you know that that people were making jokes about it you know because yeah yeah what's the alternative and you know and i think the more scared people are the more valuable the good stuff is the the, the humor the love the all these sorts of things so you know that the harder things get the more people double down on that actually i think if you look even just anecdotally, my sense of the world, just from the people that I've, I'm speaking to, is there's been like a, a sort of emotional shift in the last two or three months or the last two or three weeks, really, about how we all feel about each other. And, and maybe it's just because we're locked down, but it, it does feel to me like the human consciousness has changed in the last couple of weeks. And I hope in some ways it doesn't go back. I hope we can keep that that unity and and you know everything that we have who knows how long it will last um, think, yeah people are yearning for the little social things at the moment you're yearning for a pub garden in the sunshine mm -hmm. and a couple of pints or sitting in a park with your friends the small social interaction feels like the one people are looking for most we interested to see how it phases back i was with one of our artists dj monkey on the call just before this one we're doing some work a content piece with her she put a tweet out like i don't know 14 days ago or something that just banged like 230, 300 retweets where she said, it simply said something like, can you imagine that first party back? And yeah. 
it's where a community are so desperate to be together, to enjoy, to dance in the sunshine, to listen to great music, whatever those bits are that get you through. It's that longing of a belonging. It's that longing to be back together again. These bits are good because people can chime in. How far it takes us, I think, will be really interesting. Um, a, qu a question from, from LinkedIn, uh, James Carew says, a uh, question for James from his Copper 90 days. Football has uh, massively bad PR with multi-millionaire owners forcing pay cuts, uh, especially in the Premier League. What's, what's your opinion on that industry's performance right now of a seeming lack of uh, content and empathy? Um, I have a feeling the pressure will be too much for the likes of the Premier League and they will have to sort it out. They will have to start acting pretty swiftly. The, the, the issue with football, remember, is people love jumping on a football as a bloody rich bandwagon and having a go. And so if they see an initiative, they'll slag it off because they'll be like, hold on, this guy's on 80 grand a week. What doesn't get enough press attention is, say, Marcus Rashford. And I'm not saying that just because I'm a Man United fan. Marcus Rashford has been, the last three or four weeks, actually going further than that whilst injured, just doing the most amazing stuff around the community, around with homeless, around with young deprived kids, like super personal, genuine like use of his time, not just chucking some money at a problem. There's so much stuff like that that goes on and it doesn't necessarily become kind of the main uh, noise. The biggest, but, you know, I think the general dialogue is the Premier League can't just take money like they've always done. Now is maybe the time that something is done and given back. My local club like Hampton and Richmond are not playing another football match this season. That's going to be unbelievably damaging for clubs like that where people are on very little money. Yeah, they've got to find a way to to get it to flow down, don't they, to the lower league? Otherwise, it's gonna because uh, you know we can't just have the Premiership and the Championship survive. If everything else goes, football's exactly. Destroyed. And actually, you know what? It will be the best advert it'll ever do. It will be the best PR story it'll ever have. Now is the time to put that money and get that pyramid sorted. Yeah, because they can. If every Premier League adopted five non-league clubs. Love that. Yeah. It would cost nothing, right? It would cost them a couple hundred grand a club to guarantee survival. Right? There's, your, there's your idea. Yeah. Send it in. All right, I'll send it in. I'll send it over to Copper 90. Uh, the so yeah, it's a you know, it's it's a really it's a really interesting point about Marcus Rafford. I'm completely unaware of that, to be clear. I'm unaware of anything he's done. So that's yeah. really, you know, it sort of proves your point that people People aren't there. I think there's also a problem with that across society at the moment in that it's starting to get better. You're starting to see the good news come through. But I do feel like we're just drowning in negativity still. You know what I mean? You, you, you almost can't turn on the news. No, you definitely can't turn on the news. But even Twitter now, you open Twitter, it's it's a pretty horrendous place to be because it's, it's death tolls constantly. Bang, 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 bang. bang. You know? I think... You're hitting on a really interesting point. This continual, this this continual evolution of the tone and how people adapt to that too. We said this internally at Defected when we did virtual festival for the first time, and we assumed we were still in a moment of sort of novelty. Oh my God! Look, we can stream live. We're all together. This is amazing. We've talked quite openly internally that we assume this mood will continue to evolve, and it might be that in a few weeks we're doing even more in wellness and well-being and thinking frankly of people's minds you know we're at this sort of two-week lockdown stage at the moment that is I think infamous for people frankly losing it a little bit and you know cracks appearing and I'm sure you guys like us are spending a lot of time actually with individuals just checking people in your teams are all right well I think brands need to adapt to that changing tone swiftly too again it's going to be interesting how the biggest global agencies and brands can act in a swift way that maybe way you can or a business like Defected can or like my old lot of copper can like they can all be we can all be relatively swift if you're publicist or WPP can you be as swift I don't know maybe you can but it's maybe not as easy and this thing changes fast right you know if we are looking at numbers alongside Italy in the UK in let's say a week's time the tone won't be the same because we'll all know too many people who lost their life and that's a pretty serious sort of situation where you need brands, you need communications to be, I guess, open to that change in tone. You can't be tone deaf or you're just going to get absolutely destroyed when you go out there. I, I completely agree. I, I think it also, 
like the tone and the fact it changes so so much and the fact that in a week it could be very different i completely agree it could be it it also makes it difficult not just for brands but for publishers because it means content has to go out as it's made right you you, you can't hold anything now you know if something gets held a week it's going to be going there because definitely the tone will have changed in that week um, i agree we, we were making a, um, we've got a sub brand called Glitterbox, which is effectively like a disco inspired kind of brand. It's super, super popular at the moment. And we've been making a documentary, which is really a study of the LGBTQ plus community. It's through the eyes of the dancers, the challenges that they faced and their journey to the dance floor. We were still making the documentary when this all happened. And we were man we managed with the production company. They then decided, look, we think this is actually a super, um important story to tell so they went outside ministry saw the empty cavernous kind of club when we did a virtual festival and no one about and the streets of london empty and it's become a, a part of a story that we're going to release earlier than schedule because no one's making any stuff at the moment so we can actually get this thing edited quicker than we thought which is kind of weird in itself but you're right unless you've got something like that that will fit a narrative it's going to be gone uh within three weeks because everything's moved on so unless you're agile or you're using influential talent or personalities that can shift or you're in the world of passion like a like you are with music it's very hard to stick anything in the can and come out with it in a couple of months yeah very a question from um the youtube comments and um, i'll start with you aaron um it's from Afrisco. What do you think of the mainstream celebrities delving into YouTube in the last few weeks due to lockdown? Um, this is obviously something that's happened um, because they've been forced to, because they've got nothing else to do. They can't go and shoot in a studio. They can't go and shoot. Um, you know, they can't have a film production crew. They have to do it themselves. Like, what, what do you think the, the long-term effects of this is going to be? You know, we saw potentially two years ago when Will Smith entered the the YouTube scene, um, and then we've seen a lot of uh, celebrities come in since. Um, what do you think uh, it's going to look like in a, in a year's time from now because so many are diving in? Um, well, I mean, it's as you know very well, um, we're looking at this um, right now. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot more celebs go onto YouTube like today. Um, we're looking at helping lots of them. For those of you that, that are aware, we we um, help Nico Rosberg with, with his YouTube channel. We're looking to do the same with a few others. Why are we looking to do that? Um, a lot of them are struggling with things to do. Their shoots have gone, their shows have canceled, they're stuck at home like the rest of us. Um, but a lot of them don't really understand what to do on YouTube. Um, there's a big difference. If you go and look at what we did with Nico, what people have done with Will Smith, there's a way of doing this where you can get a lot of traction. And then there's a way of doing this where celebs just do it themselves and stick a video up online and they end up with 10,000 followers and no one cares. So um, I think it's really about making content series that people can latch into and and kick off on. Um, we will be launching something in the next week or so that we'll start talking about. But uh, aside from that, I expect to see celebrities pile into social over the next two or three months. If they don't do it now, when will they all their excuses have gone the fact they're busy is gone all these things have gone so um you know there's nothing stopping anybody creating content at home anyway um so i'd expect to see the number of celebrities doing youtube increase by like a hundredfold in the next two or three months I and think. Is, do you reckon that's a good thing is there any chance for any uh clutter or too I mean, much i think it's a good and a bad thing i think we're gonna see i think we're gonna see some really cool interesting funny things come out where because a lot of the talent a lot of this celebrity talent has real talent to be clear obviously that's why they're on tv and stuff so if you can get that out in the right way on youtube i think it'd be a great watch um but it's got to be the right stuff it's got to be people can't put content out for the sake of it it i imagine it will get pretty flooded and three four months time is not going to be the time again as we we're talking about earlier with speed i think the celebs that launch their channels and are properly producing content in the next two weeks are going to have a massive advantage over those that start in a couple of months. Yeah. We're obviously seeing a lot of, yeah, we're obviously going to see a lot of celebrities uh, dive into the, the video world. When are we going to see James Kirkham dive into yeah, the video? Yeah, when are you going to start vlogging? Is this not, is this not what we're doing right now? 
<laughs> no, this I want. I want to see content creation from you. I see you, you dive around every podcast I, I, I've ever listened to. So that, that's all well and good. Oh, I've never walked past a stage that James hasn't been sat on. I don't know if it's an event and it hasn't been James on the stage. No. <laughs> don't give me that. I just uh, appear on your video vlogs. That's all I'm up to. Well, it, 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 have you have you thought about? some of the behind the scenes stuff of what you're actually experiencing at, at Defected and maybe releasing some of that. I think you've got really interesting. There's some wicked, yeah. We, we did a little bit. Um, there's a guy who works with us, Tom Cox said, he's absolutely brilliant. He runs effectively all of our digital stuff and he used to do like Radio One bits and Glassmere and all sorts. And um, literally week one, he did a load of bits where we were publishing effectively us lot working from home because we called it slightly early and we started working from home about a week before most others did. And we started going with staff playlists, staff picks. We're doing like staff repping merch, like, like everything that's around being behind the scenes. And a lot of it was like, how's, you know, Dre and the A&R team, how she's still uh, running her A&R side of things and listening to music. And you saw literally behind the camera, uh, or you saw this guy, Connor, who's a wicked animator and what he's actually working on. I think people love to see that. If they're a fan of the brand or an agency like you guys or a label like us, people like to see that properly, not just the normal veneer and the way it's seen. They like to actually see it. So all stuff like that is good. What people don't need is episodic series with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure, James. I'm not so sure. <laughs> Give the people what they want. You've got the hair for it. The more, the more the more my hair grows like that blonde mullet in Tiger King and like you, Hugo, we're in a similar situation here. Yeah, um, we certainly can't comment on hair. No, no, not at all. <laughs> what okay. are, what is what is the long term plan then? So, what are you planning for, or how long are you planning for this to be a, a thing? How long are you planning for work from home? Um, and what does your business that you're working in now look like in? in six months time great question so defected is like this new era music company anyway so long before i arrived you know over five million fans social platforms it has this internal hype machine for make for releases which means it's not dependent on outside sort of spend and marketing so it's a pretty unique in that respect the events of course are a big part of it we've got a new basement which is like properly rigged up for doing stuff like this. So when, you know, Louis Vega pops into the office, we can do a live set with him. So all of that bit was all kind of ready to go. We're, we're making sure the team are doubling down on music and doubling down on content at the moment. So we're innovating out of the problem. So whilst we can't, you know, do cream fields this year or whilst we're not, uh, I don't know, why we couldn't do the St. Patrick's Day defected night from a few weeks back, what else can we do to bring people together? So we are absolutely, we've never had probably more ideas and initiatives that have been greenlit. And so this week and the coming weeks, there's so much coming out from like, we're doing stuff around like uh, the little seven o'clock slot at the end of the evenings. We're doing the classic shows. We're going to be bringing out a live social kind of um, interaction with some of the artists involved. We're coming back with our third virtual festival next week. I think that's exclusive, actually. I don't think anyone's announced that yet. But, yeah, Good Friday. Hello. Let's go. Let's go. It's going to be a, um, a, a biggie, probably 8, 10, maybe 12 hours. We've got a quite ridiculous lineup of people who are going to be properly uh, both live and bespoke sets for it. And we're going to keep pushing it like that. There's the documentary is going to come out even earlier. So we're lucky. And our only kind of... Our only sort of issue is what we what we don't put out ourselves if we don't think it's right or appropriate for the time. You know, we've got this filter and we're getting our team charged up to keep coming out with stuff to make sure the music we put out, the content we put out, the films we put out is spot on and appropriate and right for the time. It's great. What's the what's the best thing that you've you've seen uh, come out of this? What's the one sort of bit of positivity? You mentioned the Marcus Rashford stuff. Is, is, is there anything else you've seen where you're just you're a bit in awe of the people that are doing it outside of, of the medical workers? Which I, I, say, say, yeah, we can't, I assume, yeah. The only people we're definitely in awe with, even that was bloody touching the way it caught fire, the, 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 the applause. It felt like it was nowhere near enough. But those moments are quite rare. Like I had my little 10 year old boy with me, stood on the step with the street clapping. You don't do that. A, and you certainly don't get streets come together like that. So there's an awful lot that's come out of adversity, a bit like we've covered, which is which is nice. 
I'm going to continue to be excited by all of the small initiatives. I mentioned, I can't remember if it was at the start or before, but, you know, Tim Burgess's listening parties, which I'm such a fan of. They're such simple ideas. That's a celebrity. He's not even, we don't see his face. We don't see him on video. We only see him in tweet form writing alongside a bunch of fans at home playing a record and it's so sort of old school he's like right ready for the next track off we go and then you listen along then he talks about an anecdote about the track that you've never heard and fans are sending in their gig tickets from the time like ideas like that can come from anyone and i love the fact they're about bringing people together and i think that's the thing from the and you touched upon it aaron from this time bringing people together Everything that does that, we've got to be supportive of because that's a bloody cool thing in a world which has been so fractured and so insular or so siloed. If everything now is about bringing people together or getting people closer to an artist or talent or player, then that's really good. Great point. Um, I completely agree. And uh, on that note, I think we have the another clap tonight, don't we, at 8 o'clock? Do we? Yeah. I, believe, I believe it's happening again tonight. I didn't really I'm I, well. I, the only reason I know that is my quiz has been delayed by five minutes because of the clapping. So oh, I'm yeah. being misinformed. <laughs> well, well if, if, we're just doing it every Thursday. What, what's the relevance to the Thursday uh, at eight o'clock? Do you have any idea? I actually don't know. I don't know. Sure. I think that may be that when it started and it's it's hooked again. It's someone taking the the time slot. Which <laughs> Used to be Death in Paradise's time slot, 8 p.m. on a Thursday. Yeah, it, it is. It is a Thursday thing. Basically, uh, the return of the TV Times. Who would have thought the Radio Times scheduling would have made a massive return in 2020? The Radio TV linear programming is back. Well, that's. I think what we actually need now is a is a linear programming for YouTube. <laughs> based on when the lives are going out, right? Joe Wicks is doing his live at 9 a.m. You've got this one at 10 a.m. Right. I never thought I would say that with YouTube, that you'd have a linear fashion, but. Great. Can you just invent that? Yeah, the YouTube times, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, Joe, thanks very much. Really, really appreciate uh, appreciate your time. Um, great to see you guys doing, doing such amazing things. I, 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 I think, you know, if you take out the ability to give medical supplies, the, the thing that's most important right underneath that is keeping people entertained, keeping their mental health um, up, keeping them physically moving. So, you know, any way that anyone can do that is is brilliant. And you guys are, are definitely doing that. So congratulations. Thank and thanks on behalf of all of us, particularly house music fans. <laughs> brilliant. Thanks both. Great to speak to you. Good luck with it all. Thanks, thanks. man. Appreciate it. See you in a bit. Thanks. Appreciate it. Right, Aaron Shepard, one question before we uh, we head off for our afternoon. Um, there was an article yesterday that came out. I think it was BBC, Telegraph, uh, lots of people picked up. And then there was questions about it to uh, or at the press conference. Um, but about a fifth, they estimate about a fifth of small and medium-sized businesses are going to go out of business, going to run out of cash in the next four weeks um, because banks and the government really, are, they're talking, but they're not doing um what yeah. what are your thoughts on that um i think it depends if the the real issue is the government the the banks are not passing these loans on to businesses you know we've we've spoken to every bank going including several that are our banks and they just don't have the information and you know we're you know we may not be um, at risk in the next three weeks, but lots and lots of businesses are, and I think it's a lot higher than twenty percent. I agree. If they, don't, if they don't flow these loans through within the next two weeks, I think fifty percent will go under this month. I think if it's not done by next month, another twenty five percent will go, and you'll have twenty five percent left. Right. Very, now. very few small and medium sized businesses have a huge pot of cash sitting so under they'll them. Carry, they'll carry twenty to thirty days of cash, which they've already run through. Um, and that's not because they're they're bad at running their businesses. No one carries six months cash. It just doesn't happen. Um, well, why so, wouldn't you invest that money? Exactly. You you but, but you wouldn't hold it in the business. It would be you know that obviously depends on the scale. But you know you you wouldn't tend to hold six months cash. People are people are operating on on fifteen to thirty days worth of cash, right? So most of that's run out now. People are running on fumes everywhere. Um, and yeah, I think I don't blame the government. I blame 
the banks. Um, but the banks, you know, this is going to go. I, I can only assume that the government are going to are going to start overruling this and just forcing them. They've got to drop the personal guarantee. For those that don't understand why that's so important, like for a limited liability company in the UK, like if everything goes wrong, as a founder of the business, you're going to lose everything. But they're not going to come and take your TV off the wall. They're not going to come and take your car. They're not going to come and take the house. You know, your wife isn't going to leave you. Your husband isn't going to leave you. You're not going to have to, you know, move and do all that stuff. If you put yourself forward for a, a, a personal guarantee, you lose everything, and then they come and take everything, everything. So which why is with the situation that the, the US? Why would, yeah, has. why would any entrepreneur in that situation? put themselves like that they any no entrepreneur should take that deal nobody should take the personal guarantee do not do it the banks have to give the money without the personal guarantees they get the guarantees against the companies um and if the company doesn't you know if they don't believe that the company um has a viable future then don't lend but if you do have a viable future you've got to lend and you've got to lend quickly because this is cash flow problems the the furloughing thing which lots of people are doing doesn't save cash you're still going to have to pay the salaries this month and if you haven't got the cash to pay it you can't so you know it's you might not get that money back for six weeks so it as much as the government is trying to help and i do believe that they're trying to help and i do believe they will help right now they're not and if things don't change fundamentally in the next 10 days half the businesses that you see around you're going to go under um and i'm i'm speaking to founders every day who that is their situation if they can't get the money from the bank they're going under simple so and when we speak to the banks they're not giving the money so it's a it's a very very difficult situation the the private investor market has basically disappeared vcs have basically disappeared um they're all you know in, in as much trouble as everyone else none of them are going to invest right now if they are going to invest they're going to take you at, at pennies on the dollar and and you know that you're going to end up with your pants pulled down so you've got to try and get through this by yourselves otherwise someone else is going to take advantage of you so the only way you get through it by yourself is with the government help through the banks and then that will only happen if they actually push it through um i haven't seen it does, but it does seem like that the these pieces of pressure that have been put on the banks by the media uh, we had one about five or six days ago, which said that um, RBS and Lloyd's were releasing funds without personal guarantees up to a limit. Uh, and they were the only banks doing it. And then it was an article on the BBC saying, why aren't other banks doing this? Why would anyone sign up to a personal guarantee in the UK when there is a limited liability on companies? And then the pressure yesterday from another BBC article about the fact that 20% of business is going to go under in the next four weeks, you know, this increasing pressure is going to force the government to act. As we've seen with lots of different things so far, you know, there was huge pressure on them to do something about the self-employed. They did it. There was huge pressure to do stuff about the NHS. They're moving as much far as they can to, or to do that, or at least they're professing to. Um, so pressure yeah, from the media and the media is important. I think the problem is saying, saying it and doing it are two different things. And so throughout the last couple of weeks, the government have said it. But the reality of actually flowing billions and billions and billions of pounds of loans to millions of businesses may not be possible in two weeks. That job may actually be too big to be physically done in that time period. You know, you call the bank, you're still speaking to a human being. They want to go through your accounts. They want to do this, that and the other. They have to do that simultaneously for millions of businesses. How? It's, it's physically impossible, I think, to do it in the time period. Like, they're going to have to just, what do they do? Just put, put a load of money in a room and say, go help yourself? Like, I, that's the only way I can actually see them physically getting the money out there in time. But there's no way they can do that, obviously. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a very, very difficult one because I can, the government is saying it, but this is technical and it's and it's actually this is a good question um from trey pierce in the in the comments on linkedin doesn't organizations insurance not cover this surely they aren't uh they aren't justifying this as an act of god let me tell you now they are <laughs> insurance yeah, they are. are definitely definitely uh calling this an act of god in fact 
bit of legal information for you. If a um, if a disease spread is classified as an epidemic, it is not an act of God. And actually, the worst thing that could have happened uh, was when the World Health Organization came out and said uh, that it was a pandemic. And that is when it gets um, pushed down as an act of God and basically bails out all the insurance companies. So, and in fact, on one of our insurance documents um, for something, quite random thing actually, it says that it won't pay out in the effect of any SARS-related um, disease spread worldwide, which is so specific, but was put in like a couple of years ago, but obviously off the back of the 2009, I want to say 2009, 2010, um, SARS spread, uh, there is a clause in there uh, around that so like insurance companies i mean we we always and i always laugh about the fact that i've never seen an insurance company actually pay out uh, and they'll do everything they possibly can they've got the best lawyers in the world to make sure they never ever have to pay out but this is another example where so many people have bought insurance spent a fortune on insurance to protect themselves against these sort of things and even that's not even coming into effect uh which is a complete complete disaster really for for so many businesses I mean, it's a difficult one because if they do, if this is insurable again, that there isn't enough money to insure it anyway, right? The the whole world's gone. So we can't, like the insurance industry can't prop up the world. They haven't got enough money to do it. So if they had to pay out on everything, they'd pay the first 4% that they could afford and then they go out of business. So it's a really difficult one. But But the answer is no, there's no one, there's nobody coming in here protecting right we still have to pay our rents we still have to pay everything like it's same with everyone else like it's you can't just stop um this comment on youtube from josh saying uh, i want to remain optimistic when rishi announced his offering it was great uh, and we, we were in a similar sort of group chat to that uh, we were like oh this is this is great he's doing he's doing something um but yeah unfortunately josh said he's, he's had to um furlough staff cash will run out um and i know that some businesses won't make it so yeah i mean everyone is in this position and you know, it's, it's important for businesses and people like us who are watching every single uh, statement the government make uh, about the, the business changes and the pressure that's being put on. We're, we're, we've got a, a WhatsApp group um, which has all the different pieces of news, all the different pieces of pressure that the media are putting on um, the banks and the, and the government in order to stay as informed as we possibly can uh, on this situation. But it is, it is a tough one and lots of people are going through exactly the same thing. And that's the only positive, really. Um, if you're a business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a, if you're a director, a CEO of, of a business or, or even, you know, at the bottom of the business as well. And, it, you know, if you've just started, if you're a grad, whatever, and you're, you're just coming to a company, everyone is in the same boat. That is the weird leveler here um, where, you know, you're not alone. You know, furloughing wasn't a word that was used at all um, six weeks ago. And now you know, the UK population knows what it means. And um, you know, every business has, has had to understand it or at least had to model out what that potentially looks like for their business. And yeah, everyone's on the same boat. So um, that's the only positive that we can take out of it. And um, there will be some collective responsibility going forward and, and collective understanding exactly what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. I also um, think that, you know, I, I think it's really important that there should be no shame here. You know, if you're a business that needs to furlough people, um, you know, even if you're a business ultimately that doesn't make it through this, you know, that business won't make it through this. You'll make it through this and you'll come out of this in a different guise. So, you know, really important that we're not, we're all of us not too hard on ourselves. These are ridiculously unprecedented times and 99% and of businesses are going to get affected badly, right? It's, this is just the reality. So, you know, I think at the beginning, people were very, very reluctant to do the furloughing and thinking that they're letting people down and stuff like that. You're not. The government are stepping in to help. You're not letting anyone down. That's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. So I think really important that we don't, you know, that we understand that business leaders, and I certainly understand as one for any others out there, I understand how difficult it is, what a difficult choice you have to make right now, whether or not you furlough people, whether you take reductions, whether you, what you do, they're all difficult decisions. None of them are easy. And I, as a fellow entrepreneur, have a huge amount of, of empathy and, and, and respect for the difficult decisions that you're making. I think a lot of your staff will understand it too. Um, so, you know, let's let's not beat ourselves up because we have to make tough decisions. Everybody has to make tough decisions right now. Um, it's just about trying to make them in the right way, I think, is what's most important. Um, totally agree. Right, that's just shy of our hour. We do have some other things to get on with. We weren't going to jump off after James left, but 
Uh, we've stayed on regardless, uh, battled through the hour. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I've just seen a comment in the uh, in the LinkedIn saying, is this a brand deal with Quavers? It is not, but they are the best, Chris, and they are getting me through uh, the, <laughs> the the lockdown. Um, I've gone through packets upon packets, um, but they are sitting behind me. And I normally move them out of the way, but I've got today, so, yeah, sorry. Um, thank you very much for watching, as, as always, for joining us. Uh, James Kirk was on earlier from uh, minutes one to probably minutes 35. Uh, he's um, on the senior team at Defected Records. Um, he also just, um, well, he was about four or five years at, at Copper 90 as well, so he has an interesting take on both the sport and the music angle and certainly what's going on in culture right now. Um, and then, yeah, we've just shot the shit around, uh, around business and, and what it means and, and what's, uh, what's going to happen in the next few weeks. Um, off the back of some articles that have come out in the last 48 hours or so. But yeah, every day, 12 till 1. If, you can, if you're on LinkedIn uh, and you're still watching right now whilst I'm signing off, if you can tag someone you think it would be actually quite interesting to, to have on the, on the show, uh, that would be really, really useful. Um, we will get in touch with those people and uh, see if we can make that happen. Um, because yeah, it's not it's not easy getting uh, people to commit to a live show from from twelve to one during their lunch hour. But we've we've done two weeks of it now. Um, I've still got a few few shows lined up. But if you can if you can tag people in the comments, that'd be much appreciated. Um, and yeah, please continue to watch every single day, twelve to one o'clock, um, YouTube or LinkedIn. And yeah, we will see you tomorrow. Vlog about later. <laughs>